I normally don't live stream, and uh, I consider myself fairly terrible at it. So, I have no idea how many viewers or listeners I will get in this because I quite literally sprung it with absolutely no advertising, no warm-up, nothing. Essentially, one of the problems that I've had uh, trying to make regular content is just simply getting over a perfectionist complex. You know, I have a mild OCD and uh, hopefully some of that comes through in the quality of the videos that I make, but for the most part, I don't do anything off the cuff because I'm not happy with the results and I'm trying to get a little bit more familiar with that. Yeah, perfectionism is a bitch. Even now, uh, my entire fight or flight mechanism is engaged. My lizard brain is saying, stop this, hit stop. But um, I don't know, we're gonna give it a try. Vintage Computer Festival Midwest is at the same venue as it was last year. Uh, we are moving the talks downstairs. We have the whole venue now, so we have access to the downstairs. And the talks hall that was going to be, that was previously for talks, is now opened up to more exhibitors. And so we're going to have 25% more exhibitors this year. And we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we're also looking into some possible organizational changes, uh, which can only mean good things. It doesn't mean we're going to start uh, charging for the show. The show will always, unless a catastrophe occurs, the show will always be free to attend. It's always been that way, and, it, and we're going to try to keep it that way. But uh, we might be doing some organizational changes in the back end that might help with uh, making the show better. So uh, there is indeed a downstairs at the, of the venue. Um, and not only that, it extends uh, past the actual exhibitor area. There's a, a big room down there set up for at least 150 seats, I think, and a screen that comes out of the ceiling and everything. So we're, we're going to try to move the talks down there, and hopefully that will also help with a little bit of the crowding. One of the problems we've been trying to solve at the show is whenever we have a very popular speaker or panel of speakers, uh, the hallways get choked with people trying to get into the talks hall. And this way, we hope that the traffic flow will be better. So we will see. Uh, I'm a little worried about it um, myself because uh, we are also going to do the auction down there. Uh, the auction is the fundraising part of the show. <clears throat> it's where we auction off our own stuff and donations and whatever, and the money raised there helps pay for the show for next year. The auction is always um, a little difficult to try to manage from a logistics standpoint because we need to have an area for lots of people to be uh, and congregate and bid and see the item. However, most of the items are so large or unwieldy that they're in a different part of the venue and so we're going to have the items upstairs but the auction downstairs which means we have to look into some sort of wireless video solution or something because the venue only gives i think it's one megabit upload and five megabit download per mac address so uh that's and that's why you don't see us uh streaming the event live because there's just really not enough bandwidth we also tried using a custom like cell tower puck you know one of those custom things you can get and um that didn't work very well either because when you're actually in the venue you're surrounded uh by a ton of electromagnetic radiation <laughs> and uh radio interference so wi-fi doesn't work too well <laughs> in a vintage computer show <laughs> who'd have thunk it so we have to rely on the hotel wi-fi and hotel wired line connections and like i said it's uh, everybody gets the bare minimum which is uh, one megabit upload and so you can't really stream with that the source code is a little bit of C, but it's mostly assembler. So uh, hope you know your assembler. And we'll include our build scripts and things like that. It, the source code is written in a mixture of assemblers. I wrote my code in Turbo Assembler, and I was responsible for the loader, which loads and decompresses code and passes control of from bits of code to the other and handles signaling and, and stuff like that. The loader is essentially something that loads uh, com files um, manually, like not DOS. The loader loads them, relocates them, stuff like that. So that, that'll be released. I did that in Turbo Assembler. Uh, Viler wrote all of his parts in FASM, uh, Fast Assembler, and uh, Reenigny wrote his parts in NASM, or probably YASM, the fork of NASM. Uh, Bill Hart wrote his portions in a mixture of Watcom C and I don't remember what assembler. FTP being removed from Chrome totally sucks. 
uh, this driver archive that I used to run, it was on FTP. And then when Chrome removed FTP support, I got super angry. Um, but I set up HTTP to that URL. So if you put HTTP in front of it, the rest of the part of the URI should still work. Do you know how to make a DOS 622 install on a USB drive? Yes, actually. Um, well, wait, a DOS 622 install? Not initially. You can do a free DOS install on a USB drive simply by using Rufus, R-U-F-U-S. Uh, grab that. I think it'll even download the image for you, and you can make a bootable USB that is DOS, but it's not DOS 622. Honestly, though, um, you probably should stick with free DOS if it's the newest release, at least the released in the last year or so because they came out with a, a new release like for the first time in like a decade the reason i'm recommending free dos is because it natively supports fat 32 which would probably be very useful if you're trying to put stuff on a usb drive and then plug it into some system and boot pure dos and run it so I'm sure you can put DOS 622 on a USB, but I don't recommend it because I don't think it would be as practical as booting and using uh, free DOS. Floppy disks are hard to get? I don't know, are they really? Um, I will say this, uh, David Murray bought the last chunk of five and a quarter inch double-sided double density drives from floppydisk.com. So they no longer have any at floppydisk.com. He bought, he cleared them out because he came out with the DOS version of um, Petsky Robots recently, which you can go to his uh, website and order. And uh, he needed inventory for uh, for stock, stock inventory. Um, but are they really hard to get? Five and a quarter inch floppy drives? Uh, one of my favorite ways of getting five and a quarter inch floppies is going on eBay and looking for like huge lots of them, like 50 discs. Uh, and even if you get 50 discs for 50 bucks, it's still a dollar a disc, but generally you'll find a lot of like, you know, 200 Commodore 64 games for $80. And you're like, $80? I'm not gonna spend 80 bucks on games. But then when you do the math, you're like, oh wait, that means I'm spending only what, 70 or 60 cents a disc? Yeah, sure. And then you do that and then you don't need it to get any more discs for the next two or three years or 10 years or whatever. Commodore 64, probably not a good example because the majority of them might be single-sided. But yeah, I usually look for lots and then I've, I've I mean, I'm, I've got five and a quarter inch floppies coming out my ears here. I mean, I've got to have at least 500 spare. So uh, I've stopped acquiring them. When I was building this rig, my new rig, I got into a stupid chicken and egg problem. I had this on my last computer too, and I actually had to buy a CPU to fix it. So you get a motherboard that supports everything that goes into its socket. But you want to insert a processor that was made after the board came out. And so you have a catch-22. The board supports your processor physically, but it won't boot because it doesn't have the firmware or the BIOS support or whatever. So you're like, well, what do I do? Well, when I did it eight years ago, I had to buy a, an older CPU to boot the board to flash the BIOS that would let my new CPU work. This time, motherboards now have a flash BIOS with nothing installed option. You put the new firmware on a USB, you stick it in the back of the board, you press a button, you have no memory and no CPU installed, but you give it power, you hit that button, and it flashes, and some light blinks for seven minutes, and it flashes the firmware for you. I did that, sure enough, my new CPU worked and it booted the whole system, it was fantastic. So, hooray for progress. Why is everybody getting video archival wrong? That's the thing that drives me up the wall. It's so easy to do video archival correctly. It's just, I don't, I guess people just don't know. And so I've been trying to push the whole thing. You know, every frame has two fields in it. Each field is a different moment in time. They're not there to annoy you. They're actual content. You take both fields out of each frame. You put, you make both of those fields their own full frames. Your 30 frame per second capture should become a 60 frame per second output. This is what I'm trying to push, and yet so many other tutorials get it wrong. So that's very frustrating. A final video I might do is how to restore video and enhance it, not remaster it. I hate it when people use that term. Restoration of video is taking what you've got and cleaning it up. Remastering which is the wrong term, is when you have access to the original elements and you completely create a new 
video based on those elements. For example, the HD versions of Star Trek Next Generation. Those are true remasters. They found the old film elements, they re-scanned them at 2K, I think. They re-edited all of them together into the show and then they recreated the special effects in HD. That's a remaster. Taking a VHS tape and scaling it up to 4K is not a remaster. It's not even a really a restoration, it's like an enhancement. My first system was an Apple II Plus in 79. I think that's the first personal computer I ever touched. And, uh, and then an Osborne in 1980, CPM. The first game I remember playing is Adventure, is, is Classic Cave Adventure on the Osborne. Then the Apple II series again, dabbled with a VIC-20. And then finally, uh, my father uh, worked for AT&T and we managed to bring home a PC clone, the AT&T 6300 in 1984. And that was it. I had that sucker in my bedroom for like five and a half years. And uh, well, not in my bedroom. It was on the kitchen table for like three years, and then he bought a second one because I was using it all the time. You know what's interesting about collecting vintage systems and the PC? For the longest time, and thankfully this is different, but up until I want to say like 2010, there was almost no decent coverage of the PC. Tons of resources for the Commodore 64, the Apple II, the Amiga, the TRS-80, Atari 8-bit systems, the, the ST, and almost nothing for the original PC. That's why I started this channel. That's why I started, not my persona, whatever you want to call it. That's why I focused on that because I was like, well, someone's got to do it. And I was always wondering, why is that? And I think it's because the PC won the home computer wars. I mean, today we have PC and we have Mac. And, you know, Mac changed from Power PC over to Intel in the 2000s. So, you know, Intel won, I guess. So the PC never really went away. And so because it kind of never went away, I feel like maybe there wasn't like a whole stream of nostalgia for it or, or anything. They're like, yeah, whatever. Like PCs aren't gone. I'm still using one. Well, thankfully in the last 10 to 13 years, that's changed and people are now nicely and correctly covering the PC. That's how I originally got enamored with LGR. Uh, with Clint and reached out to him because uh, he was uh, his, some of his very first videos were early IBM PC games and hardware and stuff like that and I thought he was doing a great job and I encouraged him so and now we have a whole bunch of people covering it and I think that's great but uh, I just find that really fascinating that the PC didn't get a lot of coverage until very late so who knows is it best to use period-appropriate books to learn, or are there better modern books available? You are caught in a catch-22. The tools, like NASM or FASM, are modern, but the best learning materials are old. So if you try to follow the examples to the letter in the book, you'll create an assembly source file that NASM or FASM may not be able to actually assemble. If you want to dabble, uh, I would recommend getting pretty much any book on assembler is going to be good. I don't, I've don't. i read probably 10 or 12 of them. I haven't really come across a, a really bad one. You can grab Zen of Assembly, which is Michael Abrash's book, and it is highly technical, but he does start at the beginning, so it's very interesting to read. Or you can go with something a little bit more modest, like Mastering Turbo Assembler by Tom Swan. That one teaches you a very specific dialect of assembler, Turbo Assembler's Ideal Mode, but I recommend that because the book is great and ideal mode protects you from yourself. It is a stricter syntax of assembler. It won't let you get away with ambiguous statements. Microsoft's MASM up until version six would let, it would, would let you construct assembler source and that was very ambiguous and it would not necessarily do what you thought it was doing. A turbo assembler ideal mode fixed that. Then later, Microsoft Assembler 6.0 fixed it themselves. And so most DOS assembly was done with MASM 6.0 or higher after MASM came out. Grab any book, go to archive.org, look for any book on learning assembler, look for Microsoft Assembler or Microsoft Macro Assembler. There was a Usenet Assembler FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions text file that listed a couple of books that were good. So <clears throat> yeah, I would start with DOSBox and grab some assembler and a book and go for it. And if you're really not 
keen on proprietary assemblers, go ahead and grab uh, NASM. Things like defining segments or directives are going to be different uh, in NASM, so you may have to figure that out. But yeah, go for it. Assembler's hilarious. If you're a high-level language programmer, you look at assembler and you're like, what the hell is that? But if you know no languages and assembly is your first language, you'll learn it just fine. It's like you, you don't know how hard it is because you don't know anything else. So dive into it. Assembler is not hard. Writing good assembler is hard, but assembler itself is not hard. So that's my rant on assembler. What's your favorite modern ISA sound card clones or brand new designs for the original PC? There are many, like the AdLib clone, the Innovation and SID, the Snark Barker, and much more. Ah, uh, clones. I love the Snark Barker for its name. That's a funny name. I love saying Snark Barker. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble. Thanks so much for the questions. If you have any other questions, uh, feel free to contact me. I would prefer email because I can write a longer response, but if you want to try to get at me on Twitter, I check Twitter about once a week. I'm at MobyGamer on Twitter. Uh, you can email me at MobyGamer at gmail.com. And uh, thanks again for, for showing up.